In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today, it really comes down to this idea that we don't need to panic because I've heard people tell me not to tell people not to panic because it's like telling somebody to calm down when they're not calm. It, it never works. I disagree with that. I've seen it work before. I have told a person to calm down where it worked. I have been the person that has been told to calm down and it's worked on me before. So I disagree with the notion that telling people to calm down or not panic doesn't work. And obviously this is something that God believes too, because if you look, one of the most common phrases in both the Old and the New Testament is God telling people not to be afraid. Now granted, when that statement comes directly from God, it carries a lot more weight than when Caleb Colquitt tells somebody not to panic or not be afraid. But the point is, telling somebody not to freak out, sometimes it doesn't work, but that doesn't mean it doesn't work every time. And God has a habit of telling people to not be afraid. This is something that is true with Jesus when he's with his apostles. I mean, when they're in the middle of the storm or when they're about to see their Lord and Master crucified on a cross, he reaffirms to them over and over again, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. You know, keep a, keep a cool head. That's essentially what he's saying to them. And this is something that happens all throughout the Old Testament with Israel. There's no telling how many times in the Old Testament that God tells the children of Israel not to be afraid about the things that are coming up for them in the near future. And this is really reaffirmed in the Sermon on the Mount by Jesus. And this takes place in Matthew 6. This is going to be our reading today, Matthew 6, 25 through 34. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life, as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body, as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe the lilies of the field, they do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek after these things. But your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You see, whether you're talking about this or whether you're talking about your spiritual well-being, in other words, your sin, your redemption, God is a God that is primarily focused on who you are now, not who you were. And thank God for that. When it comes to our spiritual well-being, he's not really so much cared about the sins in our past. He's primarily concerned with whether or not we are continuing to live in them. He's primarily concerned with what we are going to do going forward, but he's not concerned about the person we used to be. And when it comes to anxiety, this is the same attitude that we ought to be adopting with our own personal lives is that we are primarily concerned with what we're doing right this second. Are we doing the right thing or the wrong thing right now? Not so much hung up on the things that we've done in the past that we're upset about, or, or we may rightfully be ashamed of and don't want to repeat, or even so much what's going to happen in the future, but primarily are we doing the things that God would want us to do right this second, right now? That's what God is primarily focused on. And that's true whether it comes to spiritual redemption 
or just whether we're doing the things that God has told us to do, like taking care of our family and doing the best that we can to make sure we're providing for ourselves and for them. God's not really worried as much about the other stuff. And I want to point out that there is a massive focus on spiritual well-being here. That if you're looking through this, you understand and understand very quickly that even though there is an aspect where you should be taking care of yourself, in other words, we all go to work when we can, when we're not quarantined. We all go to work because we know that in the future, we and our family are going to need things, and that's perfectly okay. But that doesn't mean that our spiritual well-being isn't more important. And so when the things that we're doing, even good things, even things that God commanded us to do, endanger that, then that becomes a problem. And the reason that he does not want us to be afraid, the reason he doesn't want us to be anxious, is because worrying about some horrible thing that may happen in the future is sort of the antithesis of that. We're going to be worried about our physical lives, not our spiritual ones. And this really reminded me of a fantastic quote from C.S. Lewis that it comes from one of his essays, and I'll go ahead and bring that up now, about living in the atomic age. And I want you, when you're listening to this, to just imagine instead of talking about the atomic bomb, I'm talking about COVID-19 and the virus scare that we've been having recently. Because if you think about it that way, it just fits so well. So let's go ahead and look at that from C.S. Lewis. In one way, we think a great deal too much of the atomic bomb. How are we to live in an atomic age? I am tempted to reply, why, as you would have lived in the 16th century, when the plague visited London almost every year, or as you would have lived in a Viking age, where raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat any night, or indeed, as you are already living in an age of cancer, an age of syphilis, an age of paralysis, an age of air raids, an age of railway accidents, an age of motor accidents. In other words, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. Believe me, dear sir or madam, you and all whom you love were already sentenced to death before the atomic bomb was invented, and quite a high percentage of us were going to die in unpleasant ways. We had, indeed, one very great advantage over our ancestors, anesthetics, but we have that still. It is perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of painful and premature death to a world which already bristled with it and such chances in which all death itself was not a chance at all, but a certainty. This is the first point and the first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. If we are all going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, let that bomb, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things. Praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends, over a pint and a game of darts. Not huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies, a microbe can do that, but they need not dominate our minds. This is something that was written well over 50 years ago, when everybody was freaked out about what was going to happen to the world now that the atomic bomb exists. And Lewis was saying, look, this is not a brand new situation where, oh, look, suddenly we might die. Well, yeah, but you were always going to die. That wasn't something that was really a question. And I think that one of the big things that this really illustrates to us is that there are no new problems. This is something that Solomon observed in Ecclesiastes. That every problem that shows up, it may take a different form, but ultimately, evil doesn't change. It's always present. It looks different depending on what time period you're living in. But people that were raided by Scandinavians in a Viking age, to use Lewis's analogy... That person was no more or less dead than somebody that was in Nagasaki when the A-bomb went off. And so, when we're looking at this, it makes no sense to greatly exaggerate the novelty of our circumstances. COVID-19 is no different. Yes, it is possible, unlikely, but possible, to die from coronavirus. 
and it is possible that we will get very sick and have to endure a great bit of pain in doing so. But the odds of us getting really sick and dying were already a possibility. So why would we greatly alter the way that we think spiritually because of that? Now it makes sense to take some precautions. It is a little different in the sense that the atomic bomb, there really wasn't a whole lot you could do. You, you couldn't, you know, distance yourself from relatives and friends in order to not catch atomic death. That wasn't a thing, but you can do that with this. So it makes sense to make some adjustments and to take some precautions. But like C.S. Lewis said, the idea that we need to radically alter our lives and change the way that we think physically or in heavenly terms that simply doesn't make sense because we're really not in a much different situation than we were beforehand. The scientists may have added one more way for us to die, but ultimately, that shouldn't radically alter the way that we think about our friends and our family and our life or our God. Because that's something that really hasn't, the status quo hasn't been greatly altered by the introduction of COVID-19. It also reminds us something that we really don't like to think about, but death is never very far away. Death is something that is constantly present in our lives. You know, I'm a 30-year-old man who, at the ripe old age of 28, was diagnosed with testicular cancer, which is a very survivable cancer, but one that can still kill you. And I had the advanced stage of it. And I only say that to illustrate that it is quite possible that you could get something just as severe or even fatal, no matter what your circumstances. And anybody else that was looking at me, looking at the statistics from the outside looking in, would be like, oh, that guy has no reason to worry about death. I mean, look at him. He's 28. He's in pretty good shape. He, he actually goes and works out, and he's really never been a sick a, day, sick a day in his life. He hasn't been to the hospital since he was eight years old. And yet I had cancer. And all of a sudden, my death was something that I had to seriously think about and consider. But I had already thought about that and seriously considered it before I got the cancer because I'm a Christian who had already taken precautions to make sure that my eternal destination was the right one. And ultimately, that's something that is, in a lot of ways, spiritually healthy. You don't want to be that person that walks around thinking about death constantly or constantly worrying about it because Jesus just said that you're not supposed to be anxious about things like that. But we also need to accept reality that we're not going to live forever. We may not live to the end of this broadcast for all we know. But ultimately, it's something that we need to remember that it is constantly there. And so it is most important to be worried about our spiritual well-being and our standing with God rather than our well-being when it comes to our health. And ultimately, the way that we're going to get through this is the same way that our ancestors got through living in an atomic age to remember who we are. You notice that, that part at the end where Lewis talked about, he said, if the bomb comes down, it should come down finding us doing very human things. Does it make more sense, and would you more want your last memory to be huddled up with somebody in a, uh, in a tight bomb shelter scared to death? because you refuse to leave it at any point for any reason? Or would you rather the end come because you were outside playing with your kid or watching a movie with your significant other? You see, ultimately, while I'm 100% in favor of and am myself taking precautions, trying to make sure that this coronavirus doesn't wreck society or anything like that, even if it did, the truth is, my standing with Jesus Christ is the same. And what Lewis was calling for there is to remember the kind of people that we are. That we don't become some sniveling coward because there is a new way for our bodies to be destroyed because our bodies were always going to be destroyed at some point anyway. So let us ultimately focus on the things that make us who we are, the things that we really want to do. And if you are a Christian, what that ultimately boils down to is doing the will of God and trying to conform to the image of his Son. And that way, regardless of what happens on this side of eternity, we will be assured that we will be in a better place in the next. Stay the course, friends. <laughs> Thank you.
Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow sun of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.